tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Good evening, Heartlanders. Welcome to Episode 7 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Do you ever have people tell you not to do something, and one of the first things you think is, well, I hadn't really planned on doing that, but now that you mention it, I may not be able to help myself from doing it in the future. <laughs> I had that happen recently when producer slash wifey expressed her disdain, yes, disdain, of me using the T word in this segment of the show. Thanks to one of the Heartlanders fans comment, good old Teddy Dog, I can now use his phrase and tell you dear listeners to grab a bowl of tittles and settle into two exclusive tales of pure fear brought to you by the likes of Ashley Fontaine and the premiere of author Malcolm Tanner. Let's get after it. Tonight's featured story, Derek's Destiny, was written by award-winning author Ashley Fontaine. On the precipice of a massive national emergency, Derek Willis comes face to face with an ancient evil, one determined to alter Derek's destiny. And now, Derek's destiny. Ford Street Bridge, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Wednesday, September 10, 2021. 11.55 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Willis, hurry your ass up. Can't you hear all those sirens blaring? Smell the smoke? Gunshots are popping off like Fourth of July fireworks, and the sky's a funky-ass green. Ronnie told us to leave over two hours ago. Everyone else split. We're the only fools left. Ain't you been paying attention? Downtown Minneapolis is a war zone, and we're only a few blocks away. Glancing over his shoulder, Derek fought the urge to grimace. Chester McFarlane, the newest member of the crew, was not someone he enjoyed being around on a good day. It still rubbed him raw he wasn't the site foreman, the position given to a man with less experience. He wished Ronnie McDaniel, owner of McDaniel Bridge Repair, had never hired the loser. Yes. Chester knew his way around a construction site, yet his experience was not enough to counteract a terrible demeanor. Chester was loud, obnoxious, opinionated, and a closet racist who let his antiquated ideas slip out after one too many beers. One of his favorite topics to broach was Derek's hotter-than-hot white wife, and how it angered him to see another potential mate lost to someone who should stick to his own color. Three nights ago, it took all Derek's internal fortitude to not rise to the drunken buffoon's ignorance. Maturity and wisdom enabled him to remain calm. Rude comments and snarky remarks about his marriage to Skylar 
had been something both he and his bride dealt with ever since their first date over two decades ago. In his youth, Derek didn't have a handle on his anger. Numerous physical altercations with the same type of ignorant lowlifes resulted in the loss of three good construction jobs and two arrests and convictions for battery. Thinking about the injustice of those incidents made his gut royal. He never threw the first punch, only reacted in self-defense when verbal altercations turned physical, yet he had been the one arrested. Risking a job loss now would be a major financial blow. The insurance company fought them at every turn regarding construction costs, trying to cut corners on materials, stalling because of the heat. Skyler's online party planning business was all but dead ever since the heat wave. Plus, she had just lost her mother after a long bout with bone cancer, and now they've been forced to move in with his father-in-law just to keep their heads above water. The thought of returning home, dropping the negative news on his bride, steadied his resolve to check himself. Rather than beating Chester to within an inch of his life, Derek replied no woman of any color with the lick of self-worth or common sense would consider him a viable life partner. The other employees at the bar burst out laughing. Chester's face turned crimson red from embarrassment. Tonight, Chester's braggadocio alpha dog behavior had morphed over into that of a frightened goat. Derek faked a smile while clicking off the flashlight. I had to finish up our jobs, Chester. If you're so antsy to leave, you should have helped me complete the final perimeter check to make sure everything's secure. The explosives and highly volatile chemicals don't need to be in the hands of the riders. Did you lock up the office trailer? No, I told you before I ain't getting out of this truck. The foreman watches while the laborers do the work. See now? That's why I'm your boss. Whoa! Chester jumped. That shot was close. Maybe four blocks? Any second, those riding fools are going to come across the bridge. No, they won't. Derek pointed up toward Ford Parkway to the east first and then the west. Those blue lights over there and there aren't for show. The cops have been stationed on each side for the last hour, making sure no one crosses. Didn't you pay attention to what Ronnie said before he left? Chester shook his head. When the mayor called him and said we had to leave, Ronnie reminded him about the explosives and chemicals, and that if no one was allowed to remain here to keep an eye out for looters, they might get stolen. The mayor promised him he'd block the entrances to the bridge, and he kept his word, so stop worrying. Easy for you to say. My skin's the color of those losers are out to get. You'd be just fine since you're one of them. I'm leaving. Get in right now or hoof it back to the apartment. Mentally chiding himself for leaving his work truck at the apartment because he had neglected to fill it up with gas the day before, Derek's temper got the best of him. Chester, if you do something stupid like that, I can guarantee you will no longer be employed. Ronnie counts on us to do this job. A huge explosion drowned out Derek's voice. Both men turned their gazes west toward Nicolet Avenue. Orange and red flames lit up the night sky. Derek's stomach dropped. Turning back to Chester, he held up the key to the trailer, which was tucked away underneath the bridge, only feet from the raging Mississippi River. Give me five seconds to lock the office door. Chester muttered something unintelligible before putting the work truck into gear. He gunned the engine. The tires kicked up a spray of gravel as the vehicle sped down Mississippi River Boulevard. Derek cussed a blue streak while running after him for several yards. It was no use. McFarland had floored it. Stopping to catch his breath, he glanced east. Highland Lane Apartments, the company's temporary home away from home, was several blocks away. All hell just broke loose on the other side of Ford Street Bridge, and from his limited perspective, it appeared crowds gathered on the east side, too. And he was on foot. The distinct wail of a tornado siren blared all around followed by a robotic voice. Martial law is now in place. Return to your homes immediately and shelter in place until instructed otherwise. This is not a drill. Repeating, martial law is now in place. Return to your homes immediately 
and shelter in place until instructed otherwise. This is not a drill. Derek's mouth dropped open. He couldn't believe what he just heard. Yanking his cell from his back pocket while running back toward the construction trailer, he called Ronnie, praying he was awake and sober. We're sorry. All circuits are busy. Please try her call again later. He tried again with the same result. When he tried the third time, his phone died. Damn you, Chester. When I see you again, I'll pummel your ass like I should have at the bar. Once at the trailer door, he cursed again. The flashlight was dead. It took several seconds of fumbling in the dark to secure the deadbolt. For a split second, he wished for the days before cell phones because that would mean the trailer had a landline. More gunfire erupted above his head, and this time it was close. And on his side of the bridge. Sweat poured down his face and back as he broke into a quick trot, heading east toward Mount Curve Boulevard as throngs of people swarmed the few police cruisers blocking the east entrance. Glass shattered. People screamed obscenities at the cops, demanding justice for the downtrodden. As a black man, he understood all too well their plight and full-heartedly agreed with raising concerned voices in protest. He did not, however, agree with the tactics used by some. How did burning, looting, brick-throwing, and firing weapons at each other, destroying their own cities, help the cause? In his opinion, it only hindered. If his father were still alive, he'd be appalled at the current state of racism in America. The heat wave brought out the worst in humanity, resurrecting old prejudices and reigniting the smoky embers of hate. Reverend Ezekiel Willis believed violence begat violence, and the only way society would change was when individuals examined their own hearts and extracted hate, replacing it with God's love. A weird pop, followed by a loud whoosh, made him glance upward. A cloud of thick, viscous vapor surrounded the protesters. The few he could see staggered backward while coughing. Some spit and a few vomited. In seconds, the nasty aroma reached Derek's nose. Tear gas. He zigged the opposite direction. Calm down. Everything's locked up. Time to head out. It'll be a hard run in the heat, so just pretend it's another two-a-day football practice with Coach Klein. Get to the apartment, get some gas, and head back home. In less than a day, I'll hug Skyler and Brandon so hard they might break. Just as he neared the pavement, his eyes started watering. He stumbled when his right toe connected with something hard. He tried to stay upright, arms flailing, but it was no use. His left knee slammed into the ground, sending sharp pangs up into his gut. The cell phone flew from his pocket, landing glass side down on the concrete. He heard the screen shatter. Rolling over onto his back, he bit his lip to keep from yelling out in pain. He grimaced while staring up into the hazy sky. The stars were hidden by gray smoke. The yellowish beams from the streetlights on the bridge and the azure blues and crimson reds from the police cruisers barely made a dent. Yup, just like two-a-days. Coach Klein always said my feet were too big for my body. Okay, suck it up. Now is not the time to be sidelined with an injury. A dark-colored SUV zoomed past him with its headlights off, sliding to a stop by the temporary metal building housing the explosives and chemicals. Two people jumped out, yet the interior light of the vehicle did not come on. The motion sensor by the fence kicked on, bathing the area in light. Both bodies were covered in head-to-toe black, and if they were female, they were the biggest women he had ever seen. Each carried what appeared to be M16s or maybe AR-15s. One punched in the code to the gate surrounding the building, and it slid open. Another SUV sped by, stopping inches from the gated entrance to the Ford hydroelectric plant. Two more black-clad individuals stepped out. One approached the security checkpoint. Good. Looks like the mayor took Ronnie's warning seriously and sent in two CIRT teams. What a relief. Though I'm surprised only four arrived. Guess four's better than zero. Watching both groups for a few more seconds to give his knee time to quit throbbing, he contemplated signaling the duo near the construction shed and requesting help. They probably weren't allowed to leave their posts, but they might be willing to contact someone to come rescue him. 
The one on the far left ran over to the breaker box, cutting the power. The lot went dark. The only lights remaining from the bridge, police vehicles, and water plant cast wimpy beams down to his location. Just as he turned his head, the hydroelectric plant's lights blinked once before disappearing. The area was bathed in semi-darkness. Ignoring the weird sensation from deep within, some internal instinct warning him to remain quiet and keep himself hidden behind the clump of scrub brushes, Derek stood. He needed help to get out of the area. Snatching the destroyed cell from the ground, he stared at the cracked screen. He stuffed it back into his pocket before hobbling toward the storage area, his footsteps muffled by thick grass. Legion Chaos 3 to base. Go ahead, Legion Chaos 3. The distinct crackle of radio chatter made him freeze mid-stride upon hearing the words Legion Chaos. The voices had no discernible accents. They were cold, enunciating every syllable and almost robotic. Despite the heat, every hair on Derek's body stood erect, a strong signal something wasn't right. In position and ready for approval to deploy. It is a go. Black Lamb is 11 meters south of your position. You have been spotted. Acquire target now. Derek's mouth went dry as two heads turned his direction. Panic skittered up his spine, making his legs tremble. Though he wasn't a soldier, nor had he ever been in law enforcement, he had played enough simulated war games with Brandon to realize the men weren't sent in to guard the construction site or the hydroelectric plant. Black, unmarked SUVs with the lights off. No interior lights upon exiting vehicles. Military-grade weapons held by completely camouflaged individuals who spoke like AI drones. Power cut off to both sets of building lights. Knowledge of the gate codes. A sick, twisted thought wormed around inside Derek's head. They were sent to destroy both the bridge and the hydroelectric plant and blame the destruction on the black, sacrificial lamb. You have been spotted. Black lamb. Acquire. Oh, shit. They mean me. I don't want to know what comes next. Run! Pushing past the pain in his knee, he visualized Skylar and Brandon's faces, using his love for them as fuel. He broke out into a full-on sprint. He made it about 30 yards when something sharp and hot slammed into his back, catapulting him forward. Intense, excruciating pain burned through his entire body, shaking him like Tiger with his favorite chew toy. He collapsed into a convulsing heap onto the hard ground, body contorting into the fetal position. Unable to control his limbs, mind engulfed by overwhelming terror, he could do nothing to protect himself as the sound of boots drew closer. Oh God, help me. I know I haven't spoken to you in years since Dad died and I'm sorry, but I'm begging you, let me see my wife and son again, please. My life can't end this way. Legion Chaos 3 to base, Black Lamb acquired. Proceed with assignment. Acknowledged, Legion Chaos 3 out. A set of strong hands grabbed his wrists while another set latched onto his ankles lifting him several feet off the ground. Derek wanted to fight back, to kick, punch, scream obscenities, but it was no use. His body swayed and bobbed as they carried him closer to the metal building. Within seconds, they let go. He landed on his side hard enough to knock the wind from his lungs. The sharp barbs embedded deeper, sending fresh waves of pain straight into his brain. It is pointless to struggle, Mr. Willis. The medical term for the experience is neuromuscular incapacitation. Now, it is time to watch. You are about to make history. Uh oh, he knows my name. Great, these are government tools. Damn it. A head loomed in Derek's line of vision. Faint strobes of blue and red from the police cruisers on the bridge made him appear like a character from a spy movie. The man's entire face was covered with a thick black material. Only a set of eyes were visible. The jade green orbs blinked twice. The sense of worry from before morphed into terror as he met the man's gaze. There was no humanity or trace of compassion, 
nothing but a cold, dark stare. An unseen hand jerked his head to the left. Jer couldn't believe the images his eyes relayed back to his brain. One of the men closest to him shed all the black clothing and combat boots. Underneath, he wore a yellow shirt with the distinct logo of McDaniel Bridge Repair, a pair of denim jeans, and steel-toed boots. He turned and smiled. Derek's blood whooshed in his ears. He looks enough like me. He could be my twin. The man with the green eyes addressed one of the other men not in Derek's line of vision. Cell ready to record? Affirmative. Excellent. Proceed. I will keep an eye on our little lamb. Derek's creepy clone took off toward the building housing the explosives. The other two men followed, one holding a cell phone muttering words Derek couldn't quite make out. In that instant, he knew what was about to happen and the blame placed on his shoulders. Get up! Run! Derek made a weird mewling sound as he tried to move. A fresh flow of electricity hit him so hard his teeth clanged together. His captor leaned closer. A different, strange, electrical current arced up Derek's spine. That little burst was your only warning. Try to move again and the next shock will be enough to render you unconscious. Are my instructions clear? Derek didn't, couldn't reply. Instead, he let his eyes speak for him. Good. Ah, the body count just increased dramatically. The rioters broke through the barricades. It is amazing how fast they scurry, just like ants. Oh, stop looking so distraught over the upcoming loss of their pathetic lives. Collateral damage accentuates emotional responses by the masses. Those morally bankrupt Cretans deserve the comeuppance. No, they don't! You are all cruel bastards! Such language for the son of a preacher man. The man laughed. I do not understand why you consider it cruel to give people what their hearts desire. Their insatiable cravings drove them to loot, pillage, scream, and shout for months, insisting upon a society liberated from the bonds of morality, justice, and especially law enforcement. A surging tide of disbelief and destruction, generations in the making, is coming full circle. Too bad you cannot see them from your perspective. They are like sheep with blind eyes wide open, giddy at the prospect of chains being lifted. It is what the world wants now, freedom from the constraints of believing their choices and actions carry consequences. Each generation gains knowledge and power, yet in exchange for their enlightenment, eschewed the traditions of their elders. They are narcissistic fools. None of them stop to consider the true price for such ridiculous requests. No matter, their cravings will be satiated now. The old Chinese proverb, be careful what you wish for, lest it come true, never rang truer. Do you agree? This isn't happening. No, I don't agree. Who are you people? Why are you doing this? How can you hear my thoughts? God, please stop them. No one deserves to die like this. A weird flapping noise above caught his attention. A host of black crows filled the sky. Some landed next to them, others in the trees. One perched directly on the man's left shoulder. No, not crows. Ravens. God is dead, have you not heard? I believe the year was 1966 when Friedrich Nietzsche declared so on the cover of Time. I realize the declaration was prior to your birth, but you studied history in school? And I know you conversed about the subject numerous times with your father, Ezekiel. Oh, my mistake. The correct word is argued, not conversed. If I recall correctly, the last time you two discussed the existence of God was the night before you left for college. 
during a wicked argument about your relationship with Skylar. Derek's mind spun. How does he know I was praying? About Skylar? The argument with Dad? Maybe I am unconscious and this is some weird dream? Please let that be the case. We all know everything about you, Mr. Willis, including how deep your anger runs. Oh, you have managed to hold it at bay the last nine months when Ronnie bypassed you for the position of foreman and gave it to the Neanderthal Chester McFarland, but it still resides inside you, bubbling and churning, itching to be set free. You almost let it run wild at the bar three nights ago. After their betrayal, I know you regret the decision now. We? Their betrayal? What does he mean? Hmm, I see the jolts of electricity provided quite a bit of mental fogginess. Allow me to guide you to the truth. Your perceptions about Chester are on target, yet for some reason, you miss the same red flags in Ronnie. Both men share the same ideologies about race. They stewed privately for months watching all the civil unrest, the riots, the utter chaos. Chester functioned as a ringleader of sorts, pushing and urging Ronnie to make a statement. A big, bold statement about you. Well, more specifically, about your race. How do you think we obtained the gate codes? Why Ronnie and all the other employees left, leaving you and Chester to close? Why Chester fled? Ronnie would never do such a vile thing. Your current predicament proves he did. Derek's mind spun from the betrayal. Enough of wallowing in self-pity for your naivete and blindness, Mr. Willis. Time is short, so I will answer your other question. Yes, we. Well, the men with me are not part of my superior station... The man pointed toward the metal building before pulling a syringe from his boot. They are brainwashed pawns. Humans are so full of anger, so easy to manipulate, so eager to unleash their rage on each other. However, we do have something in common. We all crave the taste of fear, just for different reasons. Superior Station? Humans? This fool thinks he isn't human, okay? I'm out cold. I must be. This isn't real. Maybe I hit my head when I fell and not my knee? Mr. Willis, you are a smart man, so stop trying to convince yourself none of this is happening. It is. We are not human. We are legion, and we are many. Our time to rise to power has arrived. Nothing can stop us. Derek's mind went back to the sermons his father preached about spirits and principalities and how they interacted with humans. No, no freaking way. Still in disbelief, even when the proof is right in front of your face? Typical human. Now, enough idle chit-chat. The clearing has begun. His time is nigh. It is showtime. You, well, a reasonable facsimile of you, have one of the many leading roles. How exciting. Your name will be known around the world in a few hours as the man who destroyed Minneapolis. Unfortunately, you will not be alive to pay for your crime. A stick and a sting and it will be over. The drug mimics a heart attack. After all, the authorities must be able to identify the terrorist responsible for so much destruction. Release him right now. The ravens screeched, fluttering off with a collective whoosh into the night sky. The loud commanding voice came from somewhere behind him. Though he couldn't see the person... Derek felt the strength and power behind the words, and he recognized the voice, though that was impossible. The man with the syringe stiffened, 
a strange mewling sound, low and menacing, escaped his lips. If he really was awake, Derek worried the taser caused major damage to his brain because the man's eyes instantly transformed from green to black, including the formerly white sections. The stench of sulfur filled the air when he spoke. Is a me dunk, Mengel. Nem vela solo demon. This is our time. Go away. I won't answer you, demon. Before Derek could blink, the man lunged with inhumane speed, disappearing from his limited sight. The sounds of a scuffle from behind him broke out. Less than five seconds later, the man's body catapulted into the air, crumpling to the ground directly in front of Derek. His head smacked the pavement with a sickening crunch. A set of unblinking, solid black eyes stared at him. The dark orbs were sunken into the orbital sockets. Derek knew he was dead, yet had no clue what killed him. He heard more noise to his left several yards away, and three distinct thumps. And then, a lone set of feet walking back to his position. A cool hand touched his cheek. Derek, can you hear me? Blinking twice to clear his head, concerned he did have permanent brain damage and was hallucinating, he gaped at the familiar face of his rescuer. Wide-set sable eyes beset with heavy creases, the broad, strong nose, the gray hair cut close, full lips parted into a warm smile. The scent of Old Spice lingered on the air. Dad? No way. He's been dead for seven years. That's it. My brain is toast. He tried to sit up yet lacked the strength. Your brain is functioning properly, Derek. I chose a recognizable form that would provide you comfort. Here, allow me to detach this torture device and then I'll get you out of here. A set of hands reached behind him, removing the metal probes of the taser embedded in his back. Despite the god-awful heat, the fingers were cool. A wave of dizziness threatened to overtake his mind. So, this is what a mental breakdown feels like. Skylar, Brandon, I hope you know how much I love you both. There now, all set. We need to leave immediately. It is not safe here. With every ounce of strength left, Derek managed to turn his head toward the shed. If he was hallucinating, he may as well play it out. If the strange interactions were not from a demented figment of his damaged imagination, hundreds, perhaps thousands, of people were in grave danger. Explosives. I know. The elderly man who looked exactly like his father bent down, scooping Derek up. With unnatural strength, he hoisted him over his shoulder. He took off, heading south, legs strong and steady, pace beyond anything capable by a human. The ground whizzed by in a blur. The sounds of the sirens, shouting and gunshots diminished to the point they were no longer audible. Mind reeling from an overload of unbelievable, impossible stimulation, Derek fought to regain control. Mentally clawing and scratching his way through the murkiness inside his head and body, he sucked in several huge gulps of air. Stop. Put me down. Gonna puke. The second the words left Derek's mouth, the man came to a halt and set him down with care on a nearby bench. After heaving into the bushes, Derek glanced over to the sign to his right. It read, Resurrection Cemetery. His mouth gave hope. How in the world did we travel mm, no, over five miles? Damn, my sense of time is all screwed up. Seems like it was only 10 seconds. Maybe 15? Time is a human measurement. It means nothing in the ethereal plane. However, if you wish an answer, it was exactly 14.2. A massive headache throbbed in his temples. Trying to wrap his mind around the fact he was conversing with a man who looked like his deceased father was too much to process. Will you please tell me what's going on? None of this makes any sense. Am I hallucinating? No. In the hospital hooked up to an IV full of morphine? No. Still out cold on the construction site? Again, no. Blowing out a huff of air as reality set in, Derek studied the man. He was taller by a good six inches than his father and a weird electrical current emanated from him like the other man. 
almost making him glow. He shook his head in disbelief. Earlier, you said a form was chosen I would recognize. The other dude with the funky eyes kept referring to humans like he wasn't one. Correct on both accounts. We are the same entities, just working for different sides. The skin on Derek's arms stood erect. Are you trying to tell me he was a... demon? And you're an angel? I am not telling you anything, Derek. I am sorry, but we must part ways. You have one minute before the bomb explodes. Here are the keys to your vehicle. It is parked over there. The man pointed to Derek's left before setting the keys on the bench. Turn right onto Lexington Avenue and follow the signs for the entrance to Interstate 35 East. From there, I believe you know your way home. A jolt of adrenaline blew through the final stragglers of doubt and confusion. Derek jumped from the bench, stunned to see his work truck sitting at the end of the lot underneath the streetlight. Wait, this is all real? You're an angel and old green eyes back there was a demon. Okay, I'll dip my toes into this pool of insanity. If what you said is true, why did you save me? We have to go back and warn everyone before they die. I am not allowed to veer from the instruction to save you and the others I am assigned to protect. Even if I had the ability or interest in breaking protocol, it would not matter. The demon no longer indwells the body of his host because I sent him back in chains to his eternal realm. The remaining three men made their choices of whom to serve years ago. Their hearts are hardened. No words or actions will break through the barrier they erected around their souls. It is too late for them. The man meant to be you has an incendiary device strapped to his body with a timer, one remotely controlled by the hands of someone I am not a high enough rank to stop. I must depart as I have others to rescue. Go. Now. Brandon will need you. Soon. Remember Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6. And one more thing you must not forget above all else. At a loss for words, Derek cocked his head, waiting for more craziness to spew from the man's mouth. Operation Jade Helmet. Do not, under any circumstances, allow Brandon to play. When the game begins, everything changes. But Derek didn't have a chance to say anything else. The man vanished in front of his eyes. Before he could grapple with the fact a person, an entity, disappeared as though never there, a huge explosion shook the ground. Turning his gaze northwest, he felt sick to his stomach while watching another ball of fire light up the dark skies. Oh my god, all those people. Instinct took over. After snatching the keys, he ran to the truck. In seconds, he was inside and cranked it to life. Gaping in disbelief at the full gas gauge, his packed bags, and a road atlas nestled in the passenger seat, he swallowed hard. A Bible that did not belong to him rested on top of the bags, opened to Proverbs 22. He didn't stop to read it as he recalled the earlier warning blaring across the tornado siren's speakers. Martial law, how am I going to make it over 850 miles without getting pulled over? His father's voice whispered in his ear. O oh, ye of little faith, son, follow the highlighted sections on the map and pay for your gas in cash at the designated stops. Drive. You will make it. There is still work for you to do. Cold shivers ran up his spine. Cash? Who carries cash nowadays? Do I need to go to the nearest ATM and... The glove box popped open. Derek jumped as handfuls of tens and twenties fell to the floorboard. Okay, okay, I get it. Have faith. Drive. Those things I can do. Derek Deshaun Willis wadded up the cash, stuffed the bills into his bag, slammed the truck into drive, and gunned the engine, more than ready to get out of Minnesota and back home to his wife and son. The previously broken radio came on by itself, blaring Sam and Dave's Hold On, I'm Coming, which was his father's favorite song. Cranking up the volume, he sang at the top of his voice, thinking if this was all just a crazy dream, at least he had good music to listen to while driving headfirst into Insanityville.
Hope you enjoyed tonight's story, Derek's Destiny, written by Ashley Fontaine. Ashley Fontaine is a major writing contributor to Fear from the Heartland. Ms. Fontaine is an international best-selling author and has penned over 23 works in numerous genres. Her works can be found on audible.com as well, including the first two books of the Legion novella series, narrated by me. To find more of her excellent work, check out her website at ashleyfontaine.net. That's Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y, Fontaine, F-O-N, T-A-I-N-N-E dot net or connect with Ashley on Facebook at Ashley dot Fontaine. In tonight's story, The Aqua Bird by Malcolm Tanner, the talents of Melissa Medina can be heard as Loretta and Jeb's mom. The Aqua Bird is a story of a young girl, Loretta, that lives in a very abusive environment. Her only escape from the terrible events she suffers is the pretty aqua bird she sees outside her window. But a black and gray ugly bird also sits in the same tree. She waves the ugly bird away and wants to always see the pretty bird. Her mental state begins to change after she runs away from home. She feels she has two personalities. One is a loving, caring person, the pretty aqua bird. The other a soul that rages in anger from the abuse she suffered as a child, the black and gray bird. She meets a young boy, Jeb, after running away. They live together, moving from town to town, doing what Jeb calls righteous things to save other children from their own nightmarish existences. But their righteous deeds may not be so righteous after all. Sit back and listen to the story of a tortured and troubled bear. Are they the ugly bird or the pretty bird? Only you can decide. And now, the aqua bird. Chapter One, The Beginning. Loretta could see two versions of the mockingbird in the tree outside her window, one with ugly gray and black feathers, the other with beautiful aqua feathers. The aqua bird was so much more pleasing to Loretta's sight. The black and gray mockingbird always landed first in the newly blossomed redbud tree. The black and gray bird seemed cold and insensitive, unable to know beauty. The aqua bird would always arrive and chase the gray bird away puffing its chest out in pride. That's me, Loretta said to herself. I'm the pretty bird. Her friends would sometimes scoff at her words. Whether she was actually the gray bird or the pretty aqua bird depended on the mood she was in that day. Loretta's emerald green eyes saw the very best of herself, the aqua bird, if you will. But there were times when her eyes turned a stone cold gray and she actually saw herself as the ugly gray and black feathered bird. She shook her head violently when she wanted it to go away, flailing her arms at the bird until she scared it off the beautiful branches. Loretta had always appeared confused about which colored bird she was, even as a child growing up in the Missouri Ozarks. Loretta and her family, if that's what you called it, lived in a trailer with a couch in front. The couch sat in the front yard grass, which was worn and never mowed. Most of the grass was dead from the summer heat. The couch sat a few feet in front of the concrete block steps that led inside the trailer. Some of the windows were broken, and the siding was moldy all along the north side. Loretta's mother would scream, and her father would yell, making Loretta cover her ears. Loretta would sing nursery rhymes until her fear went away kicking her feet outward, sometimes so fast and violent, she did not realize she was bruising her heels against the front of the couch. Her brain spoke to her in words so fast and furious, they made no sense. Loretta cried at first, but after a while, she no longer possessed tears to give. She felt her mind split into two parts. She felt she became two people. One person was helpful, 
nice and caring. That was the aqua bird. The other, well, she just denied the other person existed. It was rage and fury taking her to a new dimension, a dimension with no memory, one in which she could never recall her violent fury. That's when she was the black and gray feathered bird. It was the hitting that made Loretta really turn into the black and gray bird. Her father, Jimmy, liked bullying her mother. She would just go outside and sit on the couch, kicking her heels against its base until they were bruised, singing her repetitive rhymes. She was walking home one day at 16 and found a boy while hitchhiking on the road. He was older and stopped his pickup truck to ask her if she needed a ride. She climbed into his truck that day and never looked back at her parents' trailer she had once called home or hell. The boy's name was Jeb, and she would soon fall in love with him. He was kind and gentle to her, never yelling like her father or screaming like her mother. She was happy, and that is when the aqua bird began to appear to her. She could see it clearly at least once every day, mostly in the morning when she looked outside at the red buds, waking up with Jeb by her side in their current trailer in an old rundown park in rural Missouri. Her parents never tried to find her once she left. Loretta was out on her own, learning things a girl her age was actually too young to learn. She grew up much too fast. Sometimes Jeb would take care of kids, lost like them, trying to survive in the world. They were kids whose parents never came home and left them all alone to fend for themselves. Jeb gave Loretta a place to stay. There was no yelling or screaming. Jeb never yelled at Loretta. It was not always warm or cool enough, but they did have shelter. Many times they would find old abandoned places to stay until someone found them and they fled. Life on the road. Jeb stole food. He hunted food. He did whatever he could to help the both of them survive. Sometimes they would move into an abandoned trailer in an old park that no one owned anymore. But mostly, they found ones that were abandoned in empty fields or sparse woods. Sometimes they ate at food kitchens for the homeless, or others would give them money to eat. That is, if they weren't on the run. They seemed to be able to avoid the authorities many times for the evil they left behind them. Although it wasn't real, the aqua bird was to Loretta. It calmed her after her episodes of anger and evil. As times passed, she engaged in many more angry episodes, but Jeb was always there to direct her anger in the direction of what he called righteous behavior, to use her sparks of anger for good. Well, you know, people like us, we are only helping the children, you know, Jeb would say. But Jeb, they'll find us someday. They'll hurt us. No, they won't, Loretta. I won't ever let them hurt you. Besides, what we did was not wrong. It freed children from those terrible people. Even though Jeb was kind to Loretta, he could be evil to others. He was evil to others because he grew up like Loretta. He lived in the same kinds of places with the same kinds of parents. He promised himself that he would help anyone with parents like his and Loretta's. Jeb always lived with a mean streak, one that cost Jeb's own father his life. Jeb's father came home drunk one afternoon. Jeb was supposed to have the work done. His father barreled through the door of the trailer, pushing Jeb's mother to the floor. He took off his belt and was going to teach Jeb a lesson for being lazy and not getting the grass mowed. His father went outside to find him. He walked all around the trailer until he saw the skirting underneath torn open. Now his father was really pissed. Get your lazy ass out of there, boy. I told you to get that grass cut, and what did you do all day? Sit on your ass? No, Daddy, no. Don't hurt me, please. His father finally got a hold of his arm and struck him three times with the belt. He then kicked him square in the ass twice and then struck him in the face with his fist. Jeb lay there, bloody and scared. He would have no more of this, not ever again. This shit was going to stop right now. Jeb raised up to his knees as his father raised up to swing the belt at him one more time. Jeb crawled to his feet. His hunting knife he always carried in his jeans clenched tightly in his fist. He swung it toward his father's stomach. It plunged deep into his father's gut. 
The look of surprise and shock on his father's face did not move Jeb as he removed the knife and crimson red blood oozed from his father's stomach. For some reason, Jeb was not able to stop himself. His humiliation and rage left over from the beating he had just received drove him to plunge the knife again into the chest of his father. Again, then again, each time with more force as Jeb's rage gave him superior strength he did not know he possessed. His father finally succumbed to the vicious attack and lay flat on his back, looking up at the sky. He lay motionless, his eyes empty and hollow, lifeless. His mother ran to stop him. Jeb, Jeb, stop, stop, please! Jeb held the knife, dripping with his father's blood and stood still like a statue. Jeb's breathing was fast and labored. His mother slowly removed the knife from his hand. Run, Jeb. Run as fast as you can and never come back. It's the only way for you to survive. Run, Jeb! His mother held the knife and watched Jeb run away. My boy. My beautiful boy. It's the only way. She thought within. As she laid plans to bury her husband's body in the woods, she would tell anyone asking about Jeb's father that he up and left the family and that Jeb ran away. Jeb was officially a missing person, but they would never find him. He would evade everyone. He would learn how to survive. It was now two years since Jeb killed his father. Jeb grew in size and was now more like a man than a boy. He still defended and protected Loretta, the one he loved with all his heart, just like he loved his mother. But he taught her that revenge against all that was evil to them was actually the right way to think about life. He would tell her, how were we supposed to end all the evil, especially the things that happen to kids like us? The cops? Family services? What do they do to stop that cruelty, the verbal and physical abuse, and them not caring none for us as kids? Loretta would listen to Jeb and thought him to be the smartest man in the world. They found the trailer they now lived in empty and abandoned. It was just like the others they discovered before on their travels. None of them seemed owned by anyone, and the trailers were always empty. They would steal things, furniture, lamps, anything to help them make their trailer seem nice. They put plastic in the windows to keep their trailer warm in the winter and stole fans to cool them in the summer. They moved from one to another as people ran them off or called the police to have them removed. They always seemed to stay one step ahead of the law. Loretta and Jeb always seemed to get away as Jeb would hear his mother's voice. Run, Jeb. Run as fast as you can. Loretta always marveled at how good Jeb was at staying hidden and not being found. He knew a lot about the woods and how to hide in them. He owned knives to ward off critters and to clean food for them to eat. Jeb came along and saved her from evil, and he was teaching her how to do the same for others. One day, they sat outside the trailer on a couch they got from the Christian Center and were talking. Loretta was mesmerized by his voice and what she figured was his wisdom. You see, Loretta, these damn people don't care about their kids. They only care about drinking that whiskey and yelling and screaming that they do at each other. Them poor little kids, they ain't got nothing to look forward to. They just like you and me. We's orphans, you know. So is them kids. They just don't know that yet, Jeb said. But Jeb, it ain't right killing them people, is it? I mean... They ain't bothering us none. Loretta, when you were little, did you want to leave that old place with those nasty folks? Well, yes. I, I don't miss them people one bit. Not one. You see then? It is righteous. We help them little ones that nobody cares for. Cheb and Loretta made the best of their homeless life, finding food in shelters, clothing at thrift shops, and any money they could steal from their victims. Those victims were not necessarily robbery victims. Oh no, they were actually victims of Jeb and Loretta's righteous behavior. Jeb always worried when he heard screams of pain and anger that someone was doing wrong. He felt he needed to help those suffering abuse. The abusers weren't victims at all to Jeb. They got what they damned well deserved, just like his father. He would usually bury them in shallow graves many never to be found as he and Loretta would leave a trail of carnage behind them. Jeb never looked back at his trail of blood and vengeance. 
After all, he felt what he was doing was right. But Loretta asked the aqua bird when she would see it if they were doing right or wrong. In the end, Loretta would always puff out her chest and say to herself, That's me. I'm the pretty bird. One night, they were out walking and they heard yelling and screaming from another trailer in the park they stayed in. Two children came flying out through the door and were crying. Jeb told them both to run far away. He pulled two knives from his jacket and gave one of the knives to Loretta. This was okay, Loretta thought. We are just puffing out our chests, just like the aqua bird. She looked at Jeb with her green eyes and said, You always told me it was okay if it was for a righteous reason. Loretta then looked at the tree near the trailer where the kids ran from. The black and gray feathered mockingbird nodded its head at Loretta, giving her the signal to go ahead. She angered at the sight of that ugly bird and she began to become that second person, the one with no memory. She felt the rage rise and build inside until she could no longer hold back the impending explosion. She spun quickly towards Jeb, her eyes meeting his eyes, and he just nodded his head in the affirmative as they walked inside the trailer. A bloody fury ensued. Loretta did things to the kid's mother she never thought possible before. She attacked the man holding the gun and slashed his throat from ear to ear, sending fountains of blood into the air. Filled with a dark, furious wrath, her hands and face quickly became bloodied as her righteous anger unleashed. The two made the news that day and were quickly arrested for double homicide. She was tried for murder in the first degree, but found not guilty by reason of insanity. She was institutionalized and forever caught in the crazy dreams about those they killed. Over and over the dreams would come. Doctors were never quite certain if she actually perceived the carnage she had committed. They placed straps around her and Loretta fought and fought until the dreams subsided. The shot, the stabbings, the blood, the screams, they always came back. Chapter 2 The End The gray-feathered mockingbird landed on a tree outside her window at the sanitarium. It sang a horrid tune. Loretta looked slowly over at the bird and sneered as sweat rolled down her cheeks and forehead, her hair completely soaking wet and smelling soured. It flew away. In its place, the aqua mockingbird sat perched, echoing a much sweeter tune. The tune was righteous. Loretta's mouth transformed into a wide smile. The straps no longer hurt and her breathing began to slow down. Each time a new episode took place, the gray bird appeared. She would stab at the bird with her hand in violent strokes. The ugly bird would leave and the pretty bird would appear in its place. Loretta would then puff out her chest. That's me, she said aloud to herself. I'm the pretty bird. Righteousness. I miss you, Jeb. Jeb died 30 years earlier at the ripe age of 22 inside a trailer. Such a hard life he had lived in such a short time. No one ever told Loretta, not that her feeble broken mind would have understood. She knew he was hurt by the gunshot, but she never knew he would die. She could only remember small bits and pieces of what happened that day. The gray feathered mockingbird filled her with enough rage to explode. Loretta thought she would see Jeb soon. It was not to be. She lost all track of time with no sense of how old she was now. At 52 years old, for the past 32 years, Loretta saw the two birds at least once every single day. Each day, she shooed the gray bird away, and whenever she saw the aqua bird, she would then puff out her chest and relax enough to sleep. Jeb would watch her from his perch on the redbud tree, just out of reach, outside her window. His feathers are gray and dull the ugly bird. He did not understand why she wanted to shoo him away. He was so good to her. He had shown her how to show mercy to the unwanted children and judgment to the nasty, neglectful parents. One day, the gray bird flew away and never came back. Loretta passed that day at the age of 54. She died from an epileptic seizure. The gray bird could no longer see her, and her empty chair reminded him of what he had lost. 
his reason for coming was gone. Loretta's dreams of blood, violence, stabbing, and cutting had ended. But the aqua bird, well, it left too. But a new one came back. It landed and perched back on the same red bud that had now grown and matured to a quite large tree. The mockingbird always came back every day of every year and watched over whoever was in that room sitting in that familiar chair in the sanitarium. It was the pretty bird's job. The patients had never had anyone else to watch over them, and now it was Loretta's turn to do for them what another pretty bird had done for her. That job was to shine that strange and mysterious light upon their face during their times of misery so that they too could puff out their chests and say, That's me. I'm the pretty bird. I hope you enjoyed tonight's production of The Aqua Bird, written by Malcolm Tanner. Malcolm Tanner is an accomplished writer, was a contributor in the book Education Belly Slappers by Jim Rowe. Malcolm followed the Mike Parsons trilogy, Redemption, which was recently released on Audible, performed by yours truly, Redemption 2, Allison's Revenge, Redemption 3, Death at Downers Grove, with a new literary titan gold medal winning book that he released March 14, 2021, entitled Drowning My Suspicions. You can go to his website at www.malcolmtanner.com. That's M-A-L-C-O-L-M-T-A-N-N-E-R.com. There you can find his books, in the news, stories, human interest stories, and a place to sign up for his email list. Malcolm Tanner can also be followed on Facebook at MT Followers, also at Malcolm Tanner LLC, or on Instagram at Malcolm Tanner 8927. If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S dot net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland.